three, two, one, zero. We have to miss and we have to go on the two thirteen. this morning, early this morning, I'll tell you who I am. I'm Heidi Weber Collier. Dr. Barnhart asked me to, over two years ago, to head up the German American Heritage Committee for this year's celebrations. So this week, it's coming to fruition even more, although we've done the panels all year, starting early in the year, but uh, this week is celebration week. But let me, they've asked me to again say a few words on behalf of the Space and Rocket Center. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the U.S. Space and Rocket Center, and welcome to our continuing series, Pass the Torch, here at the Rocket Center. The Pass the Torch series features innovative, influential, and interesting panelists who've worked in space, aeronautics, engineering, science research, and made an impact to humanity at home and throughout the world. This year, as we celebrate the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11, the 2019 Pass the Torch series will also feature many aspects of the Apollo era, including the cultural impact to our community, and this is certainly one, impact to the communities all over the world. Pass the Torch is open to the public and is a great way to reconnect history, learn more about specialized topics, or even catch a glimpse of an exciting future. Pass the Torch inspires and educates young and old alike. We're pleased in this year of Apollo to feature the Pass the Torch series here at the Rocket Center and also at the Huntsville Public Library. We want to say thank you to the participants of these and especially this Pass the Torch series. You see them here in front of you. You will meet them all in a few minutes. But first, let's thank our supporters and sponsors. Our Apollo 50 Golden Anniversary Sponsor in 2019 is Intuitive Research. Please take an opportunity to visit the Intuitive Planetarium, which is now open here in the Rocket Center, that way. It's a great, great experience, so please do that while you're here. Our 2019 Pass the Torch Sponsor is Logicor, a highly qualified, dedicated workforce that provides analytical, advisory, and operational support services. We are proud to have Logicor supporting this year's very special Pass the Torch series, these panels that we've had on an ongoing basis. We also say thank you to Glen Raven Incorporated, a company which offers the world's most innovative, fabric-based, market-driven solutions. Glen Raven is providing support for digital archives, the Pass the Torch series, and they also provided some fabric for a certain lunar rover. Tease, tease. This year's panel series is a collaboration of many volunteers, including me, of the German American Heritage Committee, and Benny Jacks and Jack Stokes. Jack, would you stand, please, wherever you are? I think you were at the door. Jack? He was way in the back, trying to make sure we didn't go over fire code. So he and Benny Jacks have done a remarkable job, and it was Jack's idea to have the car show that kicked off Celebration Week on Saturday. Quite a big success despite the rain that was coming in. Okay, so now, and we also note our thanks to WHNT-TV who are recording as well as Rocket City Digital Media. They've been recording all the panels. And of course, many, many thanks to Dr. Deborah Barnhart here at the CEO of the Space and Rocket Center and the staff. Today's Pass the Torch presentation is the continuing paperclip legacy, Second Generation, which focuses on the children of the Von Braun team members who have followed in their father's footsteps and technical disciplines contributing in these areas that they'll talk about. If I get a chance at the end, I'll tell you about some other upcoming panels. Al Warden will be right after this in the Nat Geo Theater. You'll need to go to the Davidson Center. but. I know you don't want to hear from me any longer, although I am also one of the children of Paperclip. But let's get this started, and Margaret Von Braun is going to start off the introductions for us. Dr. Margaret Von Braun, thank you. Thank you, it's really exciting to see all of you here. I hope you're comfortable if you're standing up. 
Um, I want to really give big thanks to Heidi, because she, as a volunteer who, like me, has flunked retirement, has kept a lot of people engaged and on the list and keeps us focused. So thank you, Heidi. So I am one of this next generation, even though there are already a few generations after us. I want to also recognize um, my siblings, my sister Iris. She's waving here. And my brother Pete. So I wanted to, Heidi asked me to talk a little bit about my own path in, in passing this torch. I was born in Huntsville. I'm, I'm still proud to call it home. Uh, even though now when I come to Huntsville, of course, I get completely lost. Um, it, it remains a place of tremendous potential and innovation. When I come here now, I think when we left in 1970, it was a boom town then, and it seems like it has not stopped booming. So I'm literally not just rocket booming, but uh, it, it's just amazing always to come back here. Um, my own career path, I think, uh, in hindsight, started with Apollo 8, even though I probably didn't realize it at the time. But Apollo 8, of course, gave us our first view of Earth and gave us our first view of this fragile spaceship that we're all riding uh, through the universe together. And after, not long after Apollo 8 was the first Earth Day, it was really the beginning of the environmental movement in the United States. We passed our air pollution laws, our water pollution laws, and my first job was with the Environmental Protection Agency. And I remember when I told my dad, you know, I'm thinking of going into this environmental stuff, he was, a, he was a proud dad, and he always encouraged us to do anything we wanted. But I think for somebody who wanted to go to the moon and go to Mars, compared to cleaning up pollution on Earth, it had to seem a little mundane. <laughs> so I could tell that he thought, oh, that's, that's great, honey. You do that. Um, <laughs> but it's been fun, because um, as, as I've been giving these talks and reading a lot of his his speeches and his thoughts, I realized that also in the early 70s, he started to write a lot about Earth observation and pollution. He wrote about air pollution, water pollution, light pollution. Uh, only about a third of the planet can see the Milky Way because of light pollution. He wrote about energy uh, needs. So a lot of the things that I've worked on, I'm realizing, OK, he started to come around in the 70s and started to realize that protecting Earth was as important as continuing our exploration into space. When Apollo 11 happened, um, many of you were involved in being one of the 400,000 contractors who worked on that project. 400,000 people were really part of this team. And they're all part of passing this torch that we're talking about today. 600 million people watched the moon landing. Back then, that was a lot of people. Nowadays, maybe, I don't know, that many people watch the World Cup or something. But in those days, 600 million people focused on one thing at one moment was a big deal. And for me, part of Apollo and part of my father's dream really was mankind can pull together and do great things. Apollo proved to us that we're capable of doing great things, and we did something incredible. So sometimes when we're overwhelmed by you know, things seem to be going downhill or problems on Earth are too overwhelming, we have to remember the inspiration that the Apollo program really gave us. Um, so people have often said, you know, what would he say if he were here now? My first answer is always he'd be shocked that we haven't been to Mars. It's a good thing we're headed back, uh, that we don't have a presence on the moon. And if, uh, if uh, he was still talking to us kids, we'd be saying, yeah, and we need to get a woman to the moon and to Mars. <laughs> So uh, that would be my little interjection. Um, part of space travel, I think, for him, and, and part of what I've learned about it in my own life, just traveling here on Earth, is that you really do have to leave your comfort zone to get smart about where you live. So we often find the experience of travel reminds us how good it is to come home, or we learn things about ourselves by going somewhere where we don't speak the language or we don't look like anybody else. That's what travel does for you, and that's what space travel needs to do for humanity. We need to travel to space to truly travel um, in peace for all mankind and womankind. Um, some of the other things that I've learned, the, the way this rocket team, these 400,000 people, not just the 100 German rocket scientists, pulled together was part of the great success 
of the optimism that Apollo always embodied. It was a presumed success. I don't remember as a kid ever hearing about the many scenarios they had for what if something goes wrong, or you know, what are we going to do if this happens, or this is really a risky thing. I don't really remember that. I just remember thinking, OK, that's the day they go to the moon, then they land on the moon, then they come back. That's going to happen. And I think, I think part of that was, of course, this incredible attention to detail. It was part of creating an atmosphere that if something is going wrong, you need to talk about it. You need to bring it to your boss's attention. And we know there are, there are leaders who have sort of the opposite impression, that if something's going wrong, you fix it, don't bother me with it. But from what I've learned about the people that worked on this project, they very much aired problems. In fact, they celebrated when somebody came forward and said, this isn't working, we need to fix it. That's cause for celebration. And that's something to remember whenever we take on big challenges. Um, after working for EPA, I moved to Idaho 42 years ago. I was lucky enough to meet my husband, Ian, sitting here in the front row. And we, uh, we both worked as environmental engineers. Uh, I worked for the University of Idaho and got to spend most of my career with young people, inspiring them, I hope, and, and encouraging them in their futures. Ian and I also ran an environmental engineering company working on mining waste cleanup. And since we've both retired and flunked retirement, grandiosely. Uh, we started a nonprofit, and we work with communities around the world on environmental health issues, which is another one of those really daunting problems. You travel around the world and you realize how many people are affected by economic challenges, environmental challenges, climate change challenges, and you think, wow, this is, seems to be an endless problem. And that's where I have to come back to, we got to the moon, we came back, we can do this. Um, the challenge in front of us now uh, as a planet is really our, our changing climate. And NASA, we all believe in NASA, tell us with 95% certainty that this is happening. We may have some disagreements about the causes, but it is happening. We need to learn to adapt to it, and we need to learn to correct it. And we've probably got 20 years. That's a lot longer than the eight years John Kennedy gave us to go to the moon. So we can fix that problem. And um, in closing, I'd just like to say I think the, the, the best lessons I learned from my dad were, were always to keep dreaming and to keep looking forward. So whatever you're doing in your life, I hope you keep your dreams going and you are able to fulfill your dreams much like he and his team were able to. Thank you. The, moder the moderator for our panel today is Klaus Dannenberg, and he's going to come join us. And then you're going to hear from all of these guests about where their journeys have taken them. Klaus? Thanks, Margaret. Well, Heidi said she would ask to get all this stuff organized about two years ago. About a year and a half ago, she asked me if I would do this panel. And I said, no, I'm going to be busy that day. <laughs> So she picked another day, which turned out to be today. And you, know, you can only say you're going to be busy a year and a half in advance, a couple of times before it, get, it becomes awkward. So, so here we are. And I uh, just want to thank the other panelists. We'll get to who they are in just a minute, but especially Margaret, who she said uh, is from Idaho, came in from Idaho. I came in from Dallas, and, and Kurt came in from uh, Massachusetts. So it's, a, it's an important part of our lives. Uh, an part, important part of our heritage that we really enjoy and enjoy talking about, as you'll see through some of the discussions. So I want to talk a little bit about the, uh, the paperclip legacy, the second generation. And this is you know, awkward. Everybody in here can see the charts. I can, I've got a version here. here. You all can see that, except the people sitting up here in the chairs. They have to be watching you all. So don't do anything really funny or they'll be laughing at you. <laughs> Uh, so it's myself, Kurt von Braun, is, is here. I'll introduce him a little more in a minute. Uh, Martin Dom is next to him. You know. And then uh, Crystal Kuberg Dunn. And actually, they, it's set in order. I can't believe it. It's amazing. <laughs> Alphabetical order. And then Klaus Heimberg is. So uh, I do want to talk about a couple of things on the paper legacy that people forget about. And so a little bit about the rest of the story, very short some unheralded Apollo legacies that I think are important that we really do forget about. And then we'll talk about our you know, personal uh, legacies and how we got here and where we're going. 
So the rest of the story on Paperclip, we know about the rocketing. We talk about that a lot. That's probably the most popular part of Paperclip. But overall, in Paperclip, you know, there's about 1,600 scientists that, uh, and engineers that came to the United States. And that included people that, in submarine warfare and aviation, people in medicine, aviation medicine, uh, the intelligence community. There's uh, some group parts of the intelligence community that are kind of, you know, I can't get the right story on that, whether they really came as part of Paperclip or some other comparable organization. But, you know, basically the United States inherited, besides the rocket scientists, they inherited, you know, all the German intelligence community that was focused on Russia. So that was an important part. That's why that you know, era of our history uh, into, until the 80s or so was so uh, prone to uh, spies and double spies and all that sort of thing. It's, uh, it's a fascinating history if you've never really looked into that. And at the same time, when the United States got 1,600 people or so, Russia got 2,200 people. So that's a, you know, they got more. They probably didn't get the best. They didn't stay as long. A lot of them went back after a few years. But still, that part of the, the German uh, rocket group, rocket team, went to Russia. What's even more unknown is some of them went to France and to Spain, some of the same community. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the United States, the Russian, and even the French uh, you know, rockets, they're all basically the same design, done by some of the same people. So you know, the German heritage there is, is phenomenal. You know, it really is. I think the world would not be where it was today except for that group of people. And again, that group of people started off together in Germany <laughs> under Werner von Braun. Uh, secondly, uh, I want to talk a little about the unheralded Apollo legacies. We all talk about uh, the trip to the moon and how great that was, but we also forget about how it started. And you know, in the 50s, I got to tell you, it was a scary time. You know, some of the guys weren't, <laughs> you weren't, weren't around at that time. They were you know, younger than that. I'm almost 75, so I remember the 50s you know, pretty well. I remember the, the air raid drills where we went and hid under our desks. Uh, I remember Khrushchev up there in 1960 banging his shoe on the, the UN podium saying, we will bury you. Uh, and we were legitimately scared when the, the Russians first, or the USSR, the Soviets first uh, got into space with Sputnik, then got into space with the first man. Uh, it was a scary time. And so you know, the thing that you know, we'd like to see, would love to see, as Margaret talked about, had um, 400,000 people involved with the space program. But part of the reason we had that much unity was they were scared of the Russians. We talked about the space race. It was a race for a lot of reasons, a race to survive, we thought at the time. And, and it, was, it was legitimate fears. It wasn't just... Uh, something imagined, but you know, I think getting that much unity without some fear is something that probably won't happen. You know, I'd like to see it happen. I think that's a big challenge for us. I'd love to see it. But so one of the you know, the, the spin-offs, major spin-offs of the Apollo program, was in the defense systems, tactical and strategic missiles, the same propulsion systems, the same structures, the same guidance systems were involved and, and helped our defense legacy. Also helped in ballistic missile defense. Uh, some of the, uh, the Von Braun team wound up going into the uh, ballistic missile defense agencies and stayed there for a long time, you know, based out of Huntsville, and eventually when they, they uh, formed the uh, Ballistic Missile Defense Organization, actually it was SDIO at the time, under Abe, General Abe Abramson, uh, that legacy spun over into that area you know, and is still there. Uh, Earth orbital applications, uh, uh, get into orbit, and what can you do in orbit? Into all kinds of things. You know, we have communication satellites today we don't think about. We have weather satellites we don't think about. We have other kinds of uh, Earth observation satellites we don't think about. And, and people just don't put all that together. And you know, when we stopped manned spaceflight for a few years, I had a lot of people ask me all the time, said, when's the United States going to get a space program again? I said, duh. You know. <laughs> It's, it never didn't have a space program. It didn't have a manned orbital space program for a few years, but we tried to get that back. But we have so much stuff, uh, GPS, you know, so many things that are just there that it's part of now, part of our everyday life that wasn't part of our everyday life, you know, 50, 60 years ago. 
and that makes our everyday life uh, easy. Uh, modeling and simulation, uh, that's one that's, uh, you know, maybe too esoteric if you're not a technical person. Uh, we didn't have that technology, and I, and I didn't realize that because I started working in the space program in my first job. Uh, <clears throat> so after this, the moon landing and the, Apollo, the funding for Apollo and space programs went downhill. I went into doing some work for the Army. And, you know, I was a software guy, so I was doing software guidance and control. So I was writing some software and, and was briefing one of the uh, uh, program managers on how we were going to do some software and how we had some error correcting codes in there and that we'd recover from mistakes. And he said, why do you want to do that? I said, hmm, why wouldn't you want to do that? I said, well, it takes extra software, it takes extra money, doesn't it? I said, yeah, but don't you want it to correct? He said, no. I said, well, what do you do if it fails? He said, shoot another one. He was a missile guy. <laughs> and, and there's a different mindset that we didn't have on the modeling and simulation at that time. Uh, when we started doing, you know, what they used to do was shoot a lot of shots and then you know, plot them all out and figure out what the errors, what the wind errors were and other correction factors. And you didn't have to do all that. You could do a lot, a lot of that with simulation, but you didn't have the quality of simulation then that we do now. So that has evolved a long way. We didn't have trainers then. We had trainers, the link trainers, but they were nothing close to, to what we're doing now and what was needed for the Apollo program. Because on all these other things, if you screw something up, you just you know, reboot and start over again. <laughs> well, if you're on the way to the moon and screw something up, you can't just reboot. If you're, if you're in the launch cycle and you screw something up, you can't just reboot. So, so you know, the, the simulation technology, both for, for training simulation and for you know, analysis and all the different applications, just wasn't there. You know, that was a major part of the sim lab here in Huntsville, the sim lab that evolved into the Army, it evolved into other services, and has really become a major part of, uh, of our technology base today. Reliability, kind of the same thing. Reliability approaches, you know, getting the kinds of reliabilities we needed to go to the moon, you know, was a different kind of redundancy approaches that w just weren't there beforehand. And, you know, you, you get the benefit of that today because if you had, you know, pretty good reliability, 99.99% or so, you'd have 100 planes falling out of the sky every day. <laughs> and we don't think about that. The reliabilities we have, um, it spun out of the approaches that came out of Apollo are things that make our aviation uh, safe, that make our cars safe, it makes it just about everything safe, except for computers. Computers still crash and you have to reboot. <laughs> <laughs> and then Margaret's already talked about the environmental science. And, you know, this is a picture <clears throat> that started the environmental movement. It's an iconic image, you know, the uh, Apollo 8 image that was taken by Bill Anders. It, uh, it's a great image. It's the first time people really saw the Earth from space. And that started, you know, so much uh, activity as Margaret's already talked about. So that's the team that start, did this. This is a picture we've seen a lot of the uh, Von Braun team taken in 1946. We've got several of our, you know, my dad's in here. Uh, uh, Klaus's dad, the other Klaus. It's not very often you get to be on a panel with multiple Klauses. <laughs> but uh, Carl's dad, my dad, and uh, Myrna von Braun. Uh, for some reason, Kurt's dad was not in this. We still don't know why. You know, Kurt has his own theories about that. <laughs> uh, and then an, another picture you know, shows uh, uh, Martin's dad that's uh, not in this. Uh, in his, I think he has a copy of that picture. But that group stayed together, and here's you know, some 50-year-later you know, pictures from 1993 and 1990, where some of the same guys were involved. You never get all of them in the same picture twice in a row. But there are just some, some great shots. It's a great community. It continued to keep an old-timers community. And each year there were fewer and fewer old-timers, and now I guess there's none. <laughs> now it's, now we're, we, the kids, are the old-timers. <laughs> but it's just a great community. So this is our panel, again, uh, I'm Conrad Dannenberg's son. He was a propulsion guy on, uh, on the Von Braun team. I went into guidance and control. My, my dad uh, thought I was a failure because the only thing he thought made any sense was worthwhile doing was propulsion. 
So I went into that, wound up doing some drone work for about 10 years. Uh, uh, Kurt von Braun is Magnus' son. Uh, he went into the defense industry and the Im imagery primarily. Uh, Klaus Heimberg was Carl Heimberg's son. Uh, and went into environmental science and also software engineering. Uh, Crystal Kuberg Dunn was uh, uh, started working with NASA for a while with civil space activities and then wound up going into finance. She's smarter than the rest of us. She decided to make some money. <laughs> And then Martin's dad was, uh, was Werner Dom and, uh, uh, in defense industry, and then, that's not me. <laughs> and then uh, and also in unmanned systems. So that's kind of the intro, and I'll do a few charts on, uh, well, I guess what we're gonna talk about is growing up German in the United States after World War II, which was a challenge for some, not as much of a challenge for others. It was pretty good in Huntsville. It wasn't nearly as good at places outside of Huntsville. When I lived in uh, Los Angeles, I got into fights every day with kids who had lost brothers or sisters or fathers in the war, and, and they hated the Germans. And that wasn't a problem in Huntsville because Huntsville appreciated the Germans. And then some childhood memories of the space race and talk about our paperclip uh, legacy. Did it impact our careers and how did it impact them? Uh, and then how we migrated to what we wound up doing and maybe some discussions, some anecdotal things about relationships with our parents. Uh, so this is uh, my part of that, growing up on the way to the moon, uh, memories from the early years, you know, from 47 to 52. So my dad went with uh, uh, Albert Pullenberg, who nobody's ever heard of, but uh, they started a rocket club together in, uh, in Hanover. And, uh, Pullenberg went to work for Von Braun. I don't know why he didn't come to the United States, but uh, he got my dad there. My dad was in the cavalry, in the German cavalry. He got thrown by a horse early on, decided he hated horses, <laughs> and decided he'd go into rocket science instead. It's a lot better. <laughs> but he was a propulsion guy. He was a car guy. He was a mechanical engineer. He loved to work on cars, and he still loved cars you know, when he was uh, his whole life. So he went there early on. Uh, and they had lots of uh, fun rocket experiments. You, you see the, uh, the genesis for a lot of our experience with uh, Apollo through some of these early photographs, and here's kind of a mini VAB, vertical assembly building, you know, back in World War II days. But you know, the thing we forget about is they don't always work. <laughs> and one of the things I like to do with uh, some of our kids today is you know, show them some pictures, show them three or four or five you know, successful launches of, of different vehicles. Go off, it's pretty, it's going off into space, you see the plume behind it, you know. and then kind of unexpectedly show three or four that blow up on the launch pad. And, and the reaction usually is, you know, they're cheering and cheering, and then all of a sudden silence. And, and that's part, at least for me, that's part of the the thrill and the challenge and even the joy of, of being in this industry. Uh, every time, and I tell you, every time, whether it's a rocket or a missile or an airplane, every time you launch something, there's that pucker factor. Is it going to work? Is it going to work? Is it going to blow up? And, and until you've had something you've worked on fall out of the sky, <laughs> it's a feeling you don't want to have very often. So he wed my mother in Panamunda. Actually, he was uh, across the border in Poland in Swinamunda uh, in 1944. And then when they came to the United States to change a venue. Now, this is Fort Bliss from the air. Uh, think about Germany, the forests, and all the you know, greenery. And, and look, at, look at that <laughs> desolate place. <laughs> they were wondering what they got themselves into. <laughs> but... Uh, they still kept firing rockets. That's the reason they came. So they went through the bumper program with V2s, firing them from uh, White Sands. And White Sands is a big part of our legacy also. Uh, but the kids, you know, the boys had fun. Here's a picture of uh, some of the rocket scientists, you know, playing volleyball, you know, which my granddaughter would appreciate. She's a volleyball player. She's 6'2 and a volleyball player. And here's a, a big group of them over on the side, including my dad and several others, you know, the well-known ones, uh, watching. And then here's a picture of Werner taking a nap. 
That's a picture you don't see in very many of the, <laughs> of the biographies, yeah. But I mean, they're just real people, real people having a good time together. And here's a bunch of them out having beer together, you know. And this is another thing that's uh, an interesting mindset that I guess carries over and, and carries over in Kurt here. You see Kurt is a Prussian, so he's wearing a coat and the rest of us are not. <laughs> These guys wore coats and ties to everything. They're out drinking beer and wearing coats and ties. <laughs> and there's my dad with his first car. So here's our, our first Christmas in Fort Bliss, which is in 47, we, my mom and I were not here yet. And my dad sent us this uh, Christmas card. It says, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. He doesn't look very merry and he doesn't look very happy. <laughs> but he looks, he looks stern, that German sternness, you know. Uh, and coat and tie, as always. Yeah. And here we are at the first Christmas we were here, 1948. Coat and tie. Nobody there except the three of us, my mom, my dad, and me. We had to all dress up, you know. <laughs> every time. I never could figure it out. And then this is something else that you see in, you'll see in some of the other presentations. And my dad was a great artist. He, uh, he loved uh, to illustrate. He made, couldn't afford to buy a lot of stuff, so he made a lot of cards, Christmas cards, got lots of things, cartoon books and, and illustrations like this that he made up for us, you know, especially for us, which was great. We didn't know how important or how personal that was at the time, but it was really great. And here's some more playtime. My dad and me, and you know, on white sands, he's wearing a tie. <laughs> <laughs> he's out climbing the white sands and <laughs> wearing a tie. And in one of these pictures, you know, out in the boondocks in uh, New Mexico, somewhere around Rio Doso, he's wearing a coat and tie. You know, I just never understood that, you know, but the coats and ties were always there. They're always formal. Uh, and, the, you know, on the flip side of that, here's, here's my dad in one of the original Speedos, you know. <laughs> he would never let me have a Speedo. <laughs> But he got to wear them. And then, of course, we quickly learned to play cowboys and Indians or, or cowboys and bad guys. And that's me in the cowboy outfit and, and Frank Hutzel, the other guy. He couldn't afford a, a toy gun, so he's just pointing his finger. <laughs> that was when we were in California. And then, most importantly, of course, you know, here's me with my accordion. You know, all good Germans play the accordion sometime or another. You know. And so the only question I have is, where was America's Got Talent when, when I could play the accordion? <laughs> could have played Lady of Spain. <laughs> so here's the citizenship. Here's my mom and dad. Some of his early lessons learned are you know, kind of funny in hindsight. One of the first things he got here was uh, four traffic citations. He was speeding, <laughs> speeding, you know, over parking. Uh, can't read it here. Uh, turning from the wrong lane, running red lights, you know. And he, he thought he was in German. He thought he was still in Germany, German driving. Uh, here's a, a letter he wrote to the IRS. He wrote him after two years, he said, I didn't know I had to pay taxes. <laughs> I'm German, I don't have to pay taxes. Well, what he did, you know, he had to, he, Mount here was uh, almost $500, which was a lot of money in 1947. Uh, job application. This is a job application, uh, and what's interesting is the reason for leaving work. Or, <laughs> World War II. <laughs> and here's another one. It says the reason for leaving the Nazis stopped work. <laughs> I'll, I'll bet. I'll bet the Nazis stopped work. <laughs> so, and, and I love this on one of the government forms. You know, you have to fill out you know, an, an am or am not. Yeah. To the best of my knowledge and belief, I am or am not a member of any of the following groups, uh, individuals. Uh, let's see. Uh, idi idiots, imbeciles, feeble-minded. Yeah. Yeah. Now, how many people do you think filled in am there? <laughs> I mean, this is one of those government forms you just have to wonder about. And then this is, uh, I think, the last thing, but uh, uh, I love this Christmas list. It says Christmas list uh, from 1948, I think. And he says he wants some, uh, some hair tonic, wants some, some underpants, large size, 
undershirts, large size, uh, some little boxes for nails and screws and things, a pair of blue jeans. And he says, Dear Santa, I've been a good boy. <laughs> So some of this stuff is, uh, is in his files, in the archives, in the, at UAH, if you're interested. It's, uh, it's funny stuff. You have to be able to read German, but it's still funny stuff. So what I did, you know, myself, I uh, went, to, went to Huntsville High School here, after we back and forth to California several times, went here, graduated from Auburn with a BS in Aero and a Master's in Electrical Engineering, then went to P uh, SMU, got a PhD in Electrical Engineering, Worked in systems engineering, guidance, navigation, and control. I started on the Apollo program uh, in 1968. Did attitude control for the, the launch vehicles. And then went from there into satellites, into you know, missiles, into airplanes, and all kinds of other areas. Spent a number of years, 10 years, doing drone development for Lockheed. Uh, and just an interesting quick side note, and then I'll wrap up. Uh, uh, one of the things that was different it's not unexpected uh, with my dad. We did not have a good relationship when I was growing up because we didn't have much of a relationship because he was always traveling. He was out saving the country. And so he was traveling a lot, and that was you know, really more important to him than just about anything. You know, it's hard to say in, in hindsight, so could that really be? Well, it really was, and that was true for a lot of them. If you look at the divorce rates, you know, in the decades after that, they were very high. Uh, but what happened to, to us, and so he never did things with me that my friends did, play football, play games, take me fishing, stuff like that. We just didn't do that, didn't have time for that, didn't have time for the kids. And so that impacted my life in that I tried to make time for my kids, and not always successfully. But, but uh, what happened is after I graduated and started working on the Apollo program, uh, I now had some professional credentials and so we initially actually began with a professional relationship through work. We could talk about stuff from work. And then as, uh, as the moon landing passed and, and he was no longer involved with that, you know, we started talking about other things and the professional relationship grew into a great personal relationship. <clears throat> and the other thing he did that, uh, that you're benefiting from here is it took him after he retired probably six, seven years to find himself again. He tried doing some consulting and management consulting. That wasn't his thing. Tried some teaching. That wasn't his thing. And then about that time, Ed Buckby started you know, being the head of the uh, Space and Rocket Center. It was the Alabama Space and Rocket Center then. Anyway, so he, uh, he wound up working from the late 70s until his death, which was in uh, 2009 you know, at Space Camp, lecturing at Space Camp. And basically he had one lecture. He gave the same lecture if you were an astronaut, if you were a PhD propulsion person, or if you were my grandson, who was about seven or, seven or eight at the time. He got the same lecture, but he was so believable and so credible and, and so energetic that everybody always listened. So it was in, in, in there, in 1965, there's a real boss, my wife. She's back here, Betty. Raise your hand. She's embarrassed. So. So that I'll turn, I'll turn it over to Kurt, and, and hope the mic, mic holds up. All right, um, thank you, Klaus, for inviting me to ser serve on the panel, and it's been a really great week to meet everybody. Uh, there's a lot of paperclip families in the room, and it's really been wonderful. Uh, I'd also like to point out that my brother Alex is here with me, uh, over here, and uh, ready, I'm sure, to hackle me from the stands as he would when we were kids, teasing me constantly. Uh, and my lovely daughter Katie is sitting next to him as well. So learning about the paperclip legacy and all that goes with it. So uh, as you've seen, Klaus asked us all to give you a personal perspective on how the paperclip legacy shaped us all, shaped our careers, and in my case, what it was like really being Magnus's son, Werner's nephew, and because of my career choice in aerospace engineering, I guess to some degree, uh, fate's handmaiden, if you will. So what I will do is I will give you a few anecdotes from history, and then I will uh, give you uh, one antidote at the end of my talk about what it's like really, how do I deal with being a, a member of the Von Braun clan. 
So to better understand the impact of Operation Paperclip and the Apollo uh, landing on the moon and all of that on my personal psychology as well as my career direction, it's best that we start at the beginning with a little history of my dad. So Magnus uh, was the youngest of three. He was eight years younger than Sigismund and seven years younger than Magnus, than uh, Werner. So as you can imagine, being that significant age difference growing up in Berlin, there was a lot of uh, influence mongering, if you, if, if uh, you want to say, and uh, if you will, a lot of vulnerabilities for my father, and they followed the lead of, of his two older brothers, uh, almost like a puppy. And so, um, but by 1937, he broke away and went to the Technical University of Munich, where he studied organic chemistry under a professor, Hans Fischer, who actually won the Nobel Prize in chemistry in 1930. By 1940, after he had graduated, he went, uh, was drafted into the Luftwaffe because he was an avid glider pilot, as was Werner at the, at the time. And so they, he knew flying, and he was, he was drafted accordingly. But by 1943, when the war was raging, uh, Werner selected my dad to be his personal assistant up at Peenemunde to help him with uh, daily matters, fly him around the country uh, on all of his sorts of things. Now, I just wanna state very publicly today that there was absolutely no nepotism involved in this decision <laughs> process. My dad was by far the very best applicant in all of Germany to serve as Werner's assistant. However, what my dad is really best known for is his famous bike ride in the Alps on May 2nd, 1945. So as, as most of us in this room know, through the winter and spring of that year, Werner and the entire team were on the run from the SS, trying to uh, basically save their own lives. And so Werner, my dad, and, and many of the team were moving south through the country, through road stops, uh, having to disguise themselves and move all the material uh, as well and hide it away. So um, what, what ended up happening is Werner, my dad, and about five or six others found themselves ultimately by April holed up in a small inn in a mountain village named Oberjoch near the Austrian border, near where the US Army was, was camped. And so um, on the day that, that it was decided by Werner and the team, this small group of people, including my dad, to actually go make contact with the US, um, Werner, uh, my dad was, shall we say, volunteered by Werner to ride a bike down the mountain to where the US Army was purported to be camped and to surrender. Now the reason that uh, Werner gave my dad, who as you were call was seven years younger and quite impressionable, was that it was because he spoke the best English of the group. However, what my dad told my brother Alex and me many years later, that the real reason he was selected to ride the bike down the mountain was that because in his own words, and I quote, I was the most expendable. <laughs> uh, the paperclip legacy for me begins. <laughs> now, in fact, I actually thought about calling this talk the life and times of Kurt von Braun, the son of the most expendable. <laughs> now I need to emphasize that earlier in the war, my grandmother gave explicit instructions to Werner to quote, keep your little brother close during the war and get him through this awful experience alive. All right, so let's get this straight. If my grandmother ever found out 
that Werner told his little brother to ride a rickety old bike down an icy mountain road alone during wartime, knowingly and deliberately right into the hands of the enemy's army, she would have confiscated all of his rockets and sent him to bed without any schnitzel. <laughs> and to make matters worse, Werner did not even insist that my dad wear a bicycle helmet. <laughs> Oma and Osha would have been very disappointed. <laughs> By the way, this famous bike ride in the Alps, we all simply know it today as the Tour de France. <laughs> so my dad did precisely as he was told by his older brother. He rode the bike down the mountain uh, and tried to surrender to the US military. Now, I work for Raytheon, a big US defense contractor, so I'm used to regularly surrendering to the US military. <laughs> However, it was not so easy for my dad. It took the better part of half a day for him to negotiate with the American officers and to convince them that he was, in fact, trying to surrender and not sell out his brother and feather a nice little nest for himself. Remember, I said he spoke the best English, not perfect English. So after a while, uh, there was an exchanging of cigarettes and, and uh, probably some bribes involved. Uh, everything worked out in the end, and I'm very happy to say for all of us on this stage, as well as probably half the audience, that Operation Paperclip was a success. And I'm also happy to report that my father was in no way, shape, or form expended in this process. <laughs> it actually took the raising of five children before that actually happened. So. All right, so let's fast forward now to the early 1960s. Alex, my sister Lisa, and I were born outside Detroit. Now, not a lot of people outside this room know it, but Chrysler, the automobile company, was actually the big rocket builder of the day. They built the Redstone, the Jupiter, the Juno, the Saturn 1B. So, um, my dad found himself liaising between Huntsville and Detroit because, well, he spoke the best English. <laughs> or at least that's what Werner told him. I think my dad was finally starting to catch on this line and that he should probably proceed a little more cautiously when Werner told him that that was the reason. But anyway, he moved to Detroit uh, where he, he met my mother and they went into, shall we say, full-scale production. <laughs> now, from the very earliest days of when I was child, all I really remember wanting to be when I grew up was Superman. <laughs> Forget about rockets. I was self-propelled. <laughs> now, this feeling would go on for quite some time. But at this point, I knew bits and pieces of what my dad and what Werner were working on. Uh, but frankly, all I really cared about was the Detroit Tigers and the University of Michigan football team. In fact, I think I actually fell asleep during the Apollo 11 moon landing while watching it on TV. I know that's blasphemy for a, for a Von Braun to say, but hey, I was six years old, so, you know. Then when I was 14, I wanted to be a medical doctor. In fact, I, I had my mother buy me this really thick textbook on human anatomy and physiology. <laughs> I could not stop reading this for years. Now, my fascination with anatomy may have had something to do with puberty, but I would never say that publicly <laughs> because that would be, well, you know, Embarrassing. However, once I moved, once I uh, went to college, everything started to change. Now, as some of you know, my dad and mom retired to Sedona, Arizona, beautiful spot, where my dad opened uh, a liquor store. 
Who would have thought rocketry would drive a man to drink? <laughs> My sense is it, it probably had something to do with liquid oxygen. So I went to Arizona State University, um, and I, I was enrolled in pre-med at the time, and I happened to room with a guy named Scott Morris, who amazingly was majoring in none other than aerospace engineering. So apart from Scott and I watching way too many reruns of The Twilight Zone, I found myself reading all of his textbooks instead of my own. Differential equations, fluid mechanics, different, uh, uh, thermodynamics, I, I could not get enough of it. And so uh, perhaps it was luck rooming with Scott, perhaps it was genetics, perhaps it was lunar tidal forces, but ultimately um, I changed majors immediately and never looked back. So I graduated with a bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering, went on to the University of Michigan, where uh, another aerospace engineering degree studying satellite control theory, and then on to the University of Texas at Austin, where I got my doctorate in uh, astrodynamics. So think of orbital mechanics, low Earth, Earth orbit rendezvous, vous, uh, lunar orbit rendezvous, all of those kinds of things, as well as gravitational theory. Now, you'll notice in that picture there on the lower left-hand side, I actually defended my doctoral dissertation, a very stressful period, I might point out, three months after Katie was born. Clearly, I did not plan this one out very well. <laughs> but rest assured, I now know what a Gantt chart is, and I plan out my schedule much more wisely these days. So after a, uh, a two-year postdoctoral um, uh, activity, I was at, actually at the Technical University of Munich, which is where my father got his degree in 1939. I, I did not plan that out either. It just happened. Uh, after a couple of years there, I w then went to MIT to excuse me, to a place called Lincoln Laboratory, which is a uh, research and develop, it's the largest lab of, of uh, MIT, where they do research and development of advanced aerospace technologies for the Pentagon. After 14 years there, I then joined Raytheon, where I am today. I continued on with classified space work, uh, missile defense, and uh, now I'm fully immersed in, in Navy ship defense against incoming missiles, cruise missiles, ballistic missiles, and the like, as well as fleet communications and undersea uh, technologies. So regarding the undersea technologies, my dad would be very proud of me to know that I actually chose a different domain. <laughs> I, I can kind of hear him right now yelling in my ear, what, you want to be a rocket scientist? You can do so much better. You can be a doctor or a lawyer or an undersea guy. <laughs> all right, so given all of the weight of that over many years, 25 to be specific, what are my thoughts looking back, have, having chosen an aerospace degree and the weight if you will, of the Operation Paperclip and the Apollo moon landing on the name Von Braun as I go about my daily activities. Well, it's uh, complicated. So I have to say I've thoroughly enjoyed my career in aerospace. It's certainly, uh, as well as national security, it's certainly a challenging and uh, honorable profession. However, not a single week goes by that I do not get asked about my name. I suppose I had that one coming. If I had really wanted to avoid that, I probably should have stuck with my plan to just become Superman. <laughs> Although, given Werner's accomplishments, that probably wouldn't have made much difference either, so. Um, so I have to admit that growing up with the legacy of Operation Paperclip and the Apollo moon landing has its very regular reminders. 
So for example, eight years ago, there was the grand opening of the Missile Defense Agency building on the Von Braun complex at the Redstone Arsenal. And as I was thinking about this event honoring Werner, I began to think about my own professional accomplishments in relation to his. Generally, this is ill-advised. <laughs> After a period of great despondency, I realized that I had, in fact, developed my very own Von Braun complex. The only difference is that the United States government spent millions to build that one up, and I was seriously considering spending thousands in a psychiatrist's office to tear mine down. <laughs> oh, by the way, regarding the Missile Defense Agency building, my family has still not received its first rent check. <laughs> uh, Margaret? Iris, Peter, have you guys gotten anything in the mail? It's been eight years. I don't know about you guys, I really think we need to be talking about eviction. <laughs> All right, so <clears throat> let me close with a, a little antidote that I have found being a member of the Von Braun family. Now, I admit it is not a cure, but it does help. So as I've said, I work in the aerospace defense industry, so I travel extensively. I am a two million mile flyer on American and a one million mile flyer on United. But I have calculated that if I can hit two and a half million miles on American and two and a half million miles on United, I will have gone to the moon and back an equivalent of 10 times, <laughs> surpassing Werner's accomplishment by one. <laughs> Trust me, it is these little mind games that keep me from sucking my thumb behind the potted plant. <laughs> Remember, I am the son of the most expendable. <laughs> Thank you. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Martin Dom, and I also am a son of a clip and uh, I was going to give you a little bit of a background here on uh, myself and my father and how the legacy of growing up, uh, more into the mic, is that better? They didn't say there were going to be people here. So. All right, so my background in a nutshell, um, I'm the son of Werner Dom. he was the aerodynamicist, or one of the aerodynamicists on Dr. Von Braun's team. I graduated Grissom High School in 77. So I'm, I'm actually one of the younger members of, of the, of the uh, Von Braun legacy group, I guess, and, and probably one of the bigger differences is, unlike the rest of these folks, when this is done, I have to go back to work, so. Um, but I got my uh, bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering at UAH in uh, 1982, and then went on to the University of Illinois uh, to get my master's degree in mechanical engineering as well. Uh, Illinois was a, was a great place. Uh, it was a, a really good school. Yeah, one of the things I found when I was up there, though, is it definitely cured me of wanting to live where it snowed. Because here in Huntsville, snow is something that happens maybe, what, every three years or so, and it's six inches in the last two days. Uh, up there, falls in November, stays in April, and, and, and you just get to deal with it. So, um, I married my wife, Cindy, uh, who was born uh, Cynthia Lumpkin in 2005. And if you want to do the math on that, yes, I was 47 when I finally decided to get married. So. I actually managed to beat my dad. He was like in his uh, almost 40 before he, he managed to get married. Uh, a little background on my father. He was born in 1917 in Lindenthal uh, near Köln uh, in Germany, obviously. Um, he was actually on a, I think his parents were on a business trip and he apparently showed up a little bit early. Uh, the family home was in Bonn and I actually spent quite a few visits there as I got older and, and traveled to Germany and really enjoyed that area quite a bit. Um, he studied aerodynamics at the Technical University of Aachen uh, and uh, later on in Munich, uh, but he was drafted into the army before he could complete his studies, and they sent him off to France and uh, later to Czechoslovakia, 
and uh, got some pictures of him. He uh, was originally a drummer, and then they tried him out as a truck driver. And by his own admission, he, he really wasn't a very good soldier. Um, he was somewhat of a gomer pile, I think. He is his. <laughs> when the uh, request came around for people with a technical background that might be able to support the work at uh, Panamundi, he said his commanding officer was more than happy to sign the papers on him and <laughs> get him the heck out of their, their, their unit. Uh, strangely enough, that, that did probably end up saving his life because that unit was later deployed to the, the Russian front and most of those guys didn't, didn't end up making it back. So strategic ineptitude can, can be your friend. Uh, he uh, transferred to Peenemünde then in uh, late 41 um, and uh, worked primarily on the Wasserfall anti-aircraft rocket. He didn't really end up doing a whole lot on the more, much more famous V-2 missile. Uh, and then after the war and after surrendering to the Allies, uh, he went back to Aachen to finish up his degree before rejoining the team at Fort Bliss in 1947. You see a picture of my dad there in his drummer outfit and uh, uh, just a shot of him shaving and potentially contemplating space travel uh, in his later life. Um, and here again is the picture that uh, Klaus showed earlier, or, or a similar picture at least. Uh, I'm, I'm glad my father made the notation as where he's standing because I told Klaus, I, even looking at it, I, I couldn't possibly tell that that was him. Just a couple of shots of my dad in his uh, younger years when he was working at Pinamenda and then later uh, I think that was from an, an article that the Huntsville Times did on him back in 86. Uh, he transferred to Marshall Space Flight Center in 1950. He actually met my mother over here. My mother was a, on a Fulbright scholarship uh, to study social work at the University of Denver. And she had completed her stint here in the U.S. and was heading back to Germany and she stopped off to spend a week um, with some friends she'd made there at the university who happened to live in Huntsville, and they apparently had mutual friends that somehow knew my dad and thought this young single German guy should meet this young single German girl, and they dated for all of a week. Uh, I still have some pictures, on it. I was hoping I could find it, but I wasn't able to put my hands on it, of uh, the two of them uh, paddling dad's canoe on, on Lake Gunnersville. But uh, she went, ended up going back to Germany, and they wrote letters back and forth, and apparently there was a proposal in one of them. So kind of a little appalling that I came out of a union that sprung from a single week, but okay, it worked <laughs> out. It worked out. Uh, my father retired from NASA at the end of 2006 at the tender young age of 89. Uh, Dad became kind of an icon out there. I mean, he, he, he had one job his entire life. It lasted from 1948. To, to, 19, uh, to 2006, and I remember at that time, when he finally did decide to take retirement, he had had an accident and uh, had somewhat recovered from that, and then he fell and broke his arm and had somewhat recovered from that, and been out of the work for almost a year, and everybody thought it was pretty much time for him to retire. And I remember when I, in fact, the way I got him convinced that he was ready to retire was being an engineer, I put together a PowerPoint presentation <laughs> explaining to him exactly how, and, and, and this is actually true, I still have it on my computer at home. Um, for a guy who had worked for over 50 years with the government, who was a German, so obviously you don't go out and spend a whole lot of money, he still was not convinced that at 89 he could afford to retire. So he, you put together the charts, you put together the plots, there were histograms and, and spreadsheets, and when I finally was done he said, okay, it's time to retire. And it was funny because by that point he had pretty much put me in charge of his finances. And there is no prouder moment for the son of a German engineer than when he trusts you enough to put you in charge of his finances, let me tell you that. <laughs> but I was also the one that called all the different agencies um, that you had to contact to process paperwork to get his retirement through. And it, it, had a, it had a rhythm to it because I would you know, tell him who I was, tell him who I was calling about, they get his name, they get his social security number, and then there's this long pause, because they're doing the mental math and going, this guy's 89 years old, what the hell? Um, I had one lady guess that he was uh, a rural postal carrier, because she said those were the only people that, that stayed on the job that long. Um, but it really was, it was just, you know, for most folks, when you retire, you go do what you want to do. And, uh, you know, that could be fishing, that could be golf. 
Dad always lived for his work, and that's what he wanted to do in his retirement, so that's what he kept doing. And he didn't think he could afford to retire, so. Um, and he did, unfortunately, pass away just a couple of years after retirement, so we always figured that he would work up until the last minute. He, he, if it wasn't a, a heart attack at his desk that would take him out, it would be just health problems cropping up over the years, so. And I just included a shot of the old Huntsville Airport. We used to go down there and pick him up all the time there from business trips, and uh, um, it, it looks considerably different now, I have to say that. People always ask me, why is it called Airport Road? Because there used to be an airport there. <laughs> uh, myself, I was born in 1958 uh, at Huntsville Hospital, so I've actually lived here in Huntsville all my life. I spent the two years at Illinois, and that's really the only time I've spent away from Huntsville. Uh, as an engineer, it's a great town, and as a place to live, I've always found it just a fantastic place. It has a lot of the advantages that I find in bigger cities, but none of the traffic, none of the high cost of housing, so I'm, I'm perfectly happy staying here. I've got three brothers. We have no sisters. My older brother Werner has two sons. I mean, the Doms just cannot make a girl to save their lives. I <laughs> don't know what it is. Uh, but my brother Stefan is 63, and he's working at Barnes & Noble. He kind of went off into a different direction than, uh, than the technical field. My brother Werner uh, got his PhD from Caltech. Uh, he was a professor at the University of Michigan for 28 years. He did a two-year stint as the chief scientist for the U.S. Air Force and is now over at the, the Arizona State University in, in uh, Phoenix. Uh, he decided after 28 years of Michigan winters, he had had, had enough, and he's now moved over to a, a full, full desert climate and enjoys it greatly. My younger brother Tom is 58. He uh, originally worked in the defense industry. Um, he founded a small company called Net Mechanic with a couple of friends from uh, a company called Cass, if you all are aware of that, that place, and uh, got in on the early part of the, uh, the internet craze, and they did quite well until the whole bubble collapsed, and uh, he ended up getting transferred. Somebody bought the company, and they got transferred to Dallas, and he worked the exactly one year was required to work for the company after the, the sale and then quit and founded his own digital marketing firm and has been doing that ever since and seems to be doing quite well with it. So, I uh, lived at, uh, on Gallatin Street until about the age five. We, we, my dad uh, had a sm bought a small house there. Uh, we ended up, uh, it was a two bedroom and a one bath and by the time my younger brother was born it was the four of us brothers in one bedroom and my mom and dad in the other and all six of us sharing one bathroom, so that we, we still, when we get together and talk, we have nothing but good memories about that place. We really liked it, but honestly, I can see where that had to go. I mean, something had to change at that point. So we moved to uh, Martha Drive, which is over in southeast Huntsville, uh, in 1963. Um, Dad paid for both houses in cash. He was German. He was not going to borrow any money, so e even for his house, he never went into debt. Um, I went kindergarten through sixth grade at Randolph School. Uh, several of the other uh, German kids were there also. Uh, I think my parents really thought a private education was, was uh, the way to go until we got to around the um, seventh grade area and they decided, you know, this is really expensive and we're already paying for those public schools. So uh, I ended up transferring over to the uh, public school system in uh, seventh and eighth grade um, and then went to Grissom High School, as I said, uh, for my high school. Uh, we grew up speaking German at the house. My mother was very adamant that we had to learn our, our mother tongue and learn German ways. There was quite a bit of push and pull there because I'm infinitely grateful for having been given the opportunity to experience uh, another culture and, and to know another language. But it was also difficult to try and live as somebody, as a German, when everybody around you is American. And eventually they, they had to succumb to the fact that we live in the U.S. and we got to speak English at home, my mother would no longer go, ching chung chung, you're speaking Chinese, I can't understand you whenever we said anything in English. So we got to wear blue jeans and got to act like Americans after a while. <laughs> uh, just some pictures of that early time. Uh, I, I think that picture of me in the middle was taken around uh, fifth grade, uh, whenever it was, it was before the invention of the hairbrush apparently. So. Um, <laughs> On the upper left there is our house on Gallatin Street, and you can see, I mean, it's basically a dirt road at that point. That's down in the medical district now, and is, is quite, uh, quite developed all around it. Um, I was actually happy to find the address because I, I, I would like to drive by again and take a look at it and see how, how it looks these days. Uh, bottom left there, there's your future Air Force chief scientist. That's my brother playing in the backyard. 
getting slightly muddy. Uh, just a group of a family photo of us at the house on Martha Drive, and then uh, a picture of our traditional German luau. My, uh, my parents <laughs> did eventually decide that they wanted to get more into the American culture, too. And for a while there, uh, tiki restaurants were really big. I don't remember exactly what the name of it was, but they're at, uh, on, uh, on the parkway across from where Parkway City Mall was, there was uh, some kind of tiki restaurant, and we used to go there all the time, and mom decided she really liked that, so we are gonna start having luau's. And I'm almost 100% certain that's an old bath towel of ours that she's wearing there but, <laughs> as a robe, but uh, we got the torches and everything, so. They, they did, over the years, adapt more and more to the American lifestyle, but uh, they, they certainly kept up their German traditions. Uh, my own career history, uh, I ended up going to the dark side. I did not uh, work for NASA. I went to work with the Department of Defense. That it was actually more grown out of boredom than anything else. Uh, I had uh, plowed through my four-year degree at, at UAH and uh, had not taken any time off, so I thought, okay, I've already been accepted at University of Illinois for my master's degree in September. I'm just taking the whole four months off. I'm gonna kick back, I'm gonna take it easy. Well, three and a half weeks of that, and I was bored out of my mind. And so I thought, okay, but who wants to hire somebody who's only gonna be around until September? Well, it turned out that the Missile Command was hiring, and I thought, okay, you know, I'll be honest with them, I'll let them know, I'm gonna be going. They hired me, it was for the Guidance Control Director, which was something that I really wasn't, wasn't specialized in, but something I had an interest in. Um, I ended up developing a really nice hardware and a loop facility for them and, and, and was, was quite interested in, in, in the work that was done there. But uh, originally I was going to just quit and go uh, off to, to Illinois to get my degree. And when the time came, they said, well, just take, take leave without pay, don't, don't quit. Somehow they managed to, to promote me while I was gone. I'm still not sure how the heck that happened, but, but they did. And then when it was time to, to either go find a job or finish up my degree, I thought, well, let me go ahead and finish my thesis up, and then uh, I, can, I can come back, take this job I had, which now had a much better pay scale, too. So, um, and then I could find a job at my leisure. And I ended up staying with them for a couple of years. And then uh, one of my friends went to work for Coleman Research, which was just a small startup back then. And uh, he enticed me to come over to work for them. And once that inertia got, got going, I pretty much just stayed with defense for the rest of my career. Uh, did quite a bit of work in missile defense agencies uh, efforts uh, designing interceptors and, and, and later on designing target missiles, uh, kind of Frankensteining together old retired boosters for target missiles. Um, switched over to uh, uh, Miltech systems after 15 years at Coleman Research and swear, swore to myself that I would not spend another 15 years in another company and then promptly spent another 14 years working for Miltech. Uh, I did do a three year stint at, uh, at NASA finally. The, uh, did some work on the uh, Constellation Launch Abort System, which was really nice because you got to work on three rocket motors for the price of one. Um, but then that program ultimately got killed, so I ended up going back to work. And uh, in 2014, uh, my wife and I decided uh, we had uh, developed a love of sailing. And we had decided um, rather than, we had always decided, okay, we were going to sail when we retired. Uh, but then the more we researched it, the more you find People who wait that long tend to not be healthy enough and, and uh, capable enough to, to, to do that. So we thought, okay, let's do this while we can. And it's kind of one of the things I picked up from my father because he for a long time didn't enjoy his money either until my mother passed away and he married an American lady who was not about to just sit there and sock that money away into, the, <laughs> into a savings account. And, and it, it was really great for him. It, it really enabled him to open up his world. They, they started going on cruises together. And, uh, and travel together, and I just thought, it, it, it's really better to enjoy it while you got it, and enjoy it while you can. So uh, I ended up uh, quitting in 2014, and uh, we went off and sailed the Bahamas and the Florida coast for, for three years, and then we came back and had to spend a year uh, ashore here with family doings and whatnot, and then uh, went back to sailing again, and I just, on a whim, since I had all this time back here, called my company up and said, hey, can you use a guy for, for five months? And they said, sure. Apparently there's a shortage of engineers, so they're desperate enough to hire somebody for a few months. So uh, I've kind of worked that now into an arrangement where I go off and sail for six months, then come back, work for the hurricane season while we got the boat parked at uh, 
Jekyll Island and uh, then go back back again. There's my winter office. That's our, our boat. Uh, <laughs> excuse me. The sailing vessel Just One Dance. That's a name my wife came up with. We, we, we met at a dance, and that was something I used to say to her. Whenever we'd start anything new, did you ever think Just One Dance would lead to this? So that became the name of our boat. And like I said, we sail her about six months out of the year. I do a little bit of technical work while I'm on the boat. There's, uh, you can edit technical papers online and get paid a few bucks for that. So get enough to buy beer with and rum drinks and things like that. It's a, it's, a, it's a fun life, and we're enjoying it as long as we can. As far as the uh, influence of being a paperclip <laughs> legacy, it, it did not influence my career. It totally determined my career. I don't think there was ever any question, at least in my mom's mind, that all four of us would be going into, into technology. Um, I, I still talk with my wife sometimes about, okay, if it had really been entirely up to me and everything would have been wide open, would I have picked engineering? I don't know. I don't know. There's a lot of things I like to do. Um, I, I can say I've thoroughly enjoyed my career. It's been fascinating. Uh, I've, I've done a lot of very interesting work, met a lot of interesting people, did some really great traveling, got to go to uh, the United Arab Emirates, got to go to Korea and Japan, see a lot of the world. But I have to admit, I don't know whether or not uh, this would have naturally been my choice if I, if, if I really felt that it was completely up to me. Uh, didn't really end up uh, running into a whole lot of folks who knew my dad. Uh, DOD is just a different, occasionally I'd run into somebody who years ago had worked with him. Uh, but for the most part, folks thought it was fascinating to find out that he was one of the Von Braun crowd, but he, he really wasn't one of the big known names and uh, um, it, it really didn't make a big impact that way. My three years at NASA, Everybody. I mean, I, I, I couldn't go a week without people coming in my office and thinking, I worked with your dad, he was the greatest. And especially in his last years, he did a lot of mentoring of the younger folks. His last few years, he was telling me that they have no idea what to do with me here anymore. And they basically let him do whatever he wanted. And what he wanted to do was try and pass his knowledge on to the younger generation. So he ended up mentoring a whole lot of the, the, the younger engineers. And I was, I was really touched about how many people came and express their gratitude for what he taught and the patience he had with them and his, his desire to pass things on to the younger generation. So I think that's pretty much it for me and I'll go ahead and pass it on. Okay, I'm gonna try not to touch the mic. <laughs> I'm Crystal Kubrick Dunn and I also am happy to be here and see a lot of old faces, and really share about our family. Okay, better? Okay, better. So Crystal Kuberg Dunn, dad was Willie Kuberg, and he worked obviously on the paperclip Von Braun team and loved what he did. But I wanna uh, present a little bit from, from my own perspective. So first, Thank God we live in America, okay? Land of the free, home of the brave. We just lost your projector, so we're gonna work on that, so keep talking. Okay, <laughs> all right. And it is one nation under God, and it is here for everyone who is willing to work and respects all the opportunities of a democracy. And that's my viewpoint. This is the America we came to. This is the America we love. And I believe everyone here shares that. Okay. Now, I'm supposed to have my slides up, but it's okay, just came up. Okay, this slide is really a card that the team at Panamunda made for my mom and dad when they married in 42. They, it was in Sinovitz on the Baltic Sea, and uh, apparently it was a very beautiful place with all the work that went on in Panamunda and underground and whatnot. Uh, it was a very beautiful place to be. Okay. Now I wanna show you one of my treasures this is a birthday card, handmade, hand-drawn, 
for my dad on his 36th in 1953, which is the year we came to America, okay? And you will see that they show him uh, at the front of the rocket. And even back then, okay, 53, the goal was a landing on the moon. And you see the mu moon, you know, the yellow ball, and all the signatures and all the men that he worked with and a couple of ladies uh, there in Pendamunda. And uh, this really inspired me. I thought, boy, this went all the way back. And they were already talking about landing on the moon, okay? And at the bottom, it actually has, uh, please send free tickets <laughs> Pre, please send free tickets to the moon. Okay. All right, then we go. Um, this was his team in Panamunda and picture of my mom and dad at that time. And my, we thought our mom was truly beautiful when she was young. And now we go. This is Gelsen Kirchen. It was just a postcard. And I scanned it, and I thought, well, some noteworthy places in Gelsen Kitchen, which is where the family is from, where I was born, my sister was born, my older, our older brother, Dieter, was born in Senevitz at Pendamunda, and then uh, I'll go further with my younger brother, okay? So father was Willie Carl Kuberg, mother Hilda Kuklock, and they immigrated in 1953 with three children, came by boat, landed at Ellis Island in New York City. Uh, we had about a three-day layover before the train brought us to Huntsville, Alabama. And my mother always joked that they bought a big bag of bananas, and that's what we lived on for three days. <laughs> Which, which you know is not true. So then we came to Huntsville. We were met by Willie and Truda Schulze, who were our sponsors coming over. They had uh, acquired an apartment for us at Longwood Court. Back then they were new. And they had filled the refrigerator with food. And so after they left, we stayed up all night and we ate everything in the refrigerator. <laughs> true story, true story. <laughs> And uh, they came back to visit the next morning, and normally you serve coffee and cake or something to everybody that visits. There was nothing there. <laughs> so, so we laughed about it, and they took us to their home, you know, in the process. So my dad, his life's work was really uh, aerospace. He, he lived and breathed. Uh, supervisory aerospace engineering, especially in propulsion and power, and mainly in uh, liquid propulsion systems. So he instilled, number one, honesty, hard work, integrity, persistence, and loyalty. And he taught me mathematics, statistics, and logic. And I had two choices for my uh, college major, and they were math or engineering. <laughs> so I chose math. There weren't very many women mathematicians or engineering in uh, the defense uh, space and defense at that time, and he expected all A's. All right, I tried not to disappoint. <laughs> so here is our first car, which was a Chrysler, speaking on how Chrysler was in uh, aerospace and space program. And the first citizen was our younger brother, Harry, born June 17th, 1954. I always call him my little brother, although he weighs about 250 plus right now. Uh, and of course, my mom and myself. And then we talk about our first home in Blossomwood. So we lived. Uh, you know, in Longwood Court at first, and then my dad bought his first home in the Blossomwood area on Claremont Drive. I'd like to go back just a couple of minutes to our home, Longwood Court. Okay, so 
My brother and sister had to go to school, uh, Fifth Avenue. I was too young, so I snuck over there just about every day, and the principal would call and ask my mother to come and get me. <laughs> so I got into a lot of trouble for that. Then when it was time for me to go to school, I didn't want to stay, and so I went home after about a couple of weeks of that, and my dad threatened me with a very harsh spanking if I didn't stay and learn. And so from then on, I went to school just like a big girl, okay? Um, what else? Um, I, I missed my Oma and Opa in Germany very much. So at night, I would sneak out of the house and try to go back home to Germany, where they eventually had to put a big, heavy chair in front of the door every night to keep me at home, okay? Uh, let's see what else. Uh, then we get to a point where I'd like to talk a little bit about my dad again. He really was my hero. I was daddy's little girl. And he, he let me know in no uncertain terms that he didn't want to be disappointed, okay? Uh, let's see where else. Okay, my dad could fix anything. We're talking the car, the TV, the stereo, the washing machine, the refrigerator, plumbing, electrical. And finally, he was very good at taking warts off your hands and taking splinters out of your body, okay? So, let me see. So, then we talked about my brother, little brother Harry being born. He would always say when he was younger, when we were in Germany, now he was born in Huntsville, and so finally he ended up being a medical doctor in the Air Force, ended up retiring as a colonel, but one of his tours was in Germany, so he did finally go over there, okay? He is a, a doctor now in Russellville with his wife Melanie, four children, and his daughter Katie just finished her um, residency and will become a pediatrician in Athens uh, here at the end of the year. So we're all very proud of that. My older brother, Dieter, uh, I think some of these guys knew him, and he was a terror when he was a young child. And when my sister and I went through the grades that he had gone, we were almost afraid to admit that we were the sisters of Dieter, okay? Um, so Dieter ended up becoming an engineer, graduating from Auburn. He got his master's at the University of Tennessee, owned his own uh, heating and air conditioning company in Chattanooga, which is where they live. And uh, his wife, Evelyn, retired from TVA, two children, son Steve with five children, and daughter with no children, <laughs> okay? And then my sister, Inga, and she was my best friend growing up, with no doubt. And uh, Inga worked out at the Arsenal for 43 years. She began as a secretary and ended up a property management lead. And I'm um, very proud of her, very proud of her. She has two sons. One is an FBI agent, married to an FBI agent in El Paso. They have three children. Pretty rambunctious, but that's okay. <laughs> and uh, she has another son who's a neurologist. And you have to know, Inga was divorced from her first husband, the father of the children, so she really raised them on her own, and they ended up being wonderful, you know, citizens of the United States. Um, let's see what else. And then, uh, won't go into my story yet, okay? So Inga lives with her current husband, Louis. They travel extensively. They have a little poodle, Peppy, that keeps them busy that uh, my husband, Tom, gave to her and named him. Okay. Now we go to a Blossomwood School photo. And uh, Iris von Braun is there at the, kind of near the bottom at the right. 
and lots of our friends, uh, Linda Anderson is in there, Jane is in there, uh, Elizabeth Halsey is in there, and I'm kind of at the middle left uh, up above that. And I want to share that Iris was my very close friend in like fifth and sixth grade, and I really treasure those times. We would spend the night back and forth uh, at each other's homes, uh, rode our bikes everywhere all over town, went to the YMCA every week to exercise and swim, followed by hot fudge Sundays at the drugstore next to Butler's shoe store, <laughs> and then we took the bus back home. Uh, they uh, had invited me to go with them on their houseboat as long as I could get along with the dog, Pitch. At the time, I was afraid of animals. I love them now. I speak their language now. <laughs> but, and uh, on one of those times on the houseboat, uh, Margaret and Iris's dad, Dr. Von Braun, taught me how to water ski. So that, I was probably 10 years old then. And so it was quite a time. And then two other things at their home. One time, we almost lit the house on fire. We were playing out in this little shed to the right of the house. And another time, we were playing on the roof where we shouldn't have been, and I fell down. And the mom fixed me up so I could go home and not let my mother know what had happened. <laughs> OK? All right. Now we go to my mom and dad, and my mom belonged to coffee clutches. This is where ladies get together, and they drink coffee, and they eat, and they have wine, and they share stories, and they gossip. That's literally <laughs> what they did. And they would come at like 11, and they would leave at like 4 or 5. Sometimes my dad came home from work, and they were still there. And you might see some of the familiar faces in the pictures uh, of some of the family friends of that time. Okay. Now, our mom did, uh, let's see where I am. Okay, I'm gonna go back one, one second. My mom did needlework. She baked, she was a seamstress. Uh, she kept a perfect home with our help, of course, doing chores, um, homework, every, everything that she taught to my sister and me as we were growing up. And then in 1996, two years after my dad died of a heart attack, she began taking courses at UAH. And she wrote her own autobiography and one of the items that she wrote about, she said, well, when we were in Sinovitz, meaning Panamunda, uh, they loved the water, they were happy, they were young and in love, and, you know, it was pretty idyllic except for, you know, the war going on. Um, I, I want to share with you that she lived 20 years beyond uh, our dad's passing, and one time we, uh, Ask Inga and my mom, we flew them out to Houston, which we did regularly after he died. And we were in Galveston, and we were shopping. After we had gone sightseeing and eaten and all that, we went shopping. And the item that my mom picked to buy for herself is this little frog on his back holding weights, holding weights up. And I. I said, what, what does that signify? Why did you pick that over any other you know, trinket that you could have picked up as a memory? And she said, after her husband Willie died, this is the way she felt. And I'll tell you, in my finance world, I, I work with many widows, and they do feel like the weight of the world is on their shoulders, and they have to do everything on their own, and I did my best to help her cope, and my husband did, and Inca did, uh, but she still felt like she was all alone and had to do everything that he used to do. Because remember, it was a German family, and the man was the head of the household, or so it was in quotes, right? <laughs> all right. Let's 
Francisco, he's telling me to go quickly. So what I'm going to do is just flip through these and let y'all, let's see, back. Here we go. Okay. Here we go. So uh, this one just shows my attitude in life. I put God first and... Um, Rule is to treat other people the way you should be treated, but that attitude is all important. 10% is what happens to you, 90% is how you react to it. Okay, and this is my beautiful hubby, Tom, who's here in the audience. Uh, he's my soulmate, he's my partner in life, and he's the love of my life. We've been married 48 wonderful years. Um, Knew each other three weeks when we eloped. So I took him to the airport. He was home on leave from Vietnam. And uh, I had to go home and face the music. He was on his way back. And so uh, with that, uh, he came back six months later, moved to California, then got out. He got his first degree, his second degree, and his PhD after we were tired and moved back home, okay? So, this is where we visited Germany in 2001, along with other places, commemorating the spacewalk on the moon. We came home for that. Uh, this is just right before I went into finance. It was like how to unleash your potential well, you cut the, all cords, right, with your prior life. And at the bottom, it says, you know, it's all about love, and then comes money, right? <laughs> so then, all right, so here we were. After my husband retired, we became husband and wife team in Houston at Merrill Lynch. Uh, we're uh, honored to go to the headquarters in New York. This is the president of Merrill Lynch at the time. Bob Mulholland, and then 2011 came, okay, and where they bombed us. So uh, <clears throat> now, then we came back home. We were there t almost two decades as a husband and wife team. Then we moved back home because of Tom's health, and this was our home site. And it says, again, if you don't have God at the core, you know, you'd be building on sand not on rock, and uh, there's our little puppy, Liberty, <laughs> who thinks she's queen of the mountain. And then in 2010, in the uh, Redstone Rocket, they had a 2010 lasting tribute, and that's Hans Fickner at the front, and Jackie Donenberg is there on the right, okay? And then, uh, this is my career briefly, just uh, I worked in defense as an engineer from the East Coast, I mean West Coast to the East Coast, then overseas on Kwajalein, then to Houston, and Houston is where I switched and went from aerospace and defense to finance, which is what I always wanted to do. And the whole time my dad was still living, he said, when are you going back to your real job? <laughs> that was, that was, and in 1994, we were uh, lauded in an article in Time, Fortune, and Forbes. And uh, that was a big achievement at the time. And uh, then just began working, uh, serving uh, clients and doing what uh, I love to do the most, and that is to teach people about money and that you can't separate your life from your money. How much does it cost us a day to live now is sometimes, certainly a month, is really what it used to cost, uh, cost us a year to live, okay, if, if even that much, all right? So it's very expensive now. Uh, I, I love what I do. I'm 70 now. I was born in 1949. Don't plan to retire, so I'll be like Kurt Dom. We're at 89. Maybe I'll think about stepping down <laughs> or dying on the job, but uh, just just love every minute. It's exciting to me, and it's very rewarding emotionally and and physically and and mentally. So with that, I'll pass this on to Klaus Heimberg. Thank you.
I don't really have a very cohesive or distinguished career, but I will tell you how it came about and mention some of my more entertaining experiences. My father was Carl Heinberg, who was director of the test lab at ABMA, later astronautics lab at NASA. I should tell you about the roundabout path by which he got into the rocket business. In 1936, someone turned him in for derogatory comments he made about Hitler, and he was arrested and jailed. Through connections, he was able to get out, but under the condition that he leave Germany. So he went to work for a German consulting firm in Japan. Taking a leave four years later, he traveled back to Germany by Trans-Siberian Railroad, arriving just 12 days before he was drafted into, wait a minute, 12 days before the German army invaded Poland. Ultimately, unable to get back to Japan, he was drafted into the army and on the way to occupied France was reassigned to Penamunda. Like many others there, he got to Penamunda by military assignment roulette. Uh, next, my mother's straight path to Fort Bliss. My father was unmarried when he came to the United States. In 1947, he wrote his mother asking about the availability of one Hannah Holtz, a daughter of his neighbors. Hannah's mom and his mom were good friends, and in the course of their negotiations, they must have concluded that Hannah's younger sister, Ruth, would be a more compatible match. <laughs> the two ladies aligned the stars accordingly, and soon enough became my grandmothers. And this is just one such romance. There were a number of other bachelors on the Von Braun team, including Von Braun himself. In 1948, there was a great bridal rush back to Germany, <laughs> followed by the great El Paso German-American baby boomlet. <laughs> so I was born in El Paso in 1949. By the time I was a year and a half old, my family was making the migration to Huntsville with the rest of the rocket team. I grew up in a mostly German neighborhood here in Huntsville with a front row seat for the race to the moon. The first time the idea of outer space clicked into my kid brain was when, on my way to the comics, I noticed the big Sputnik headline in the Huntsville Times. The goal of putting a man on the moon got in there a few years later, when my father, pointing at one of those enormous early evening full moons, asked me, do you think we can land men there in 10 years? My youth and education. Fast forward. As I remember it, I spent my early youth on three big things. Exploring the woods and abandoned fields where the Fagan Springs subdivision was built. Two, closely watching construction of the roads and houses there. And three, making wood projects with my father's tools. Later came a whole career in the Boy Scouts. School. After learning English in kindergarten, I went to East Clinton and Blossomwood Elementary schools. I was lucky that my parents bought into the Randolph School sales pitch early. In 1959, I became a member of its very first fifth grade class. Three other members of the 1949 El Paso baby cohort were in my class. Most of them are here today. Iris von Braun, Barbara Paul, and Peter Grau. I went to Huntsville High 64 through 67. College. I majored in physics at what is now Rhodes College in Memphis, Tennessee. I took a one semester Fortran course in 1968, which amazingly proved to be the foundation of my career. To be honest, I never thought of any career other than one in research and development, or R&D as you know it. We didn't have any neighbors who were doctors or lawyers or grocers or business owners. Everyone was in the rocket business. I had a pretty good introduction to government contracting from the dinner table stories of my father. He thought it was absolutely essential that NASA have its own manufacturing capability so that it could have some notion of the realistic costs of the rockets it sent out for bid. And he would rail about how contractors gouged the American taxpayer when there was a change order. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the government contracting facts of life. 
Um, I had summer jobs that completely reinforced my interest in R&D. I worked two summers at Thiokol Chemical Corporation, where I learned about solid rocket motors and the defense industry. I spent the summer of 1969 at McDonnell Douglas in Huntington Beach, California, in the Skylab test section. Skylab testing was all done automatically by computer. That was my introduction to application software. I remember watching the moon landing in a house in Costa Mesa, California, where I was renting a room. I graduated in 71 with a BS without ever achieving full tail wagging enthusiasm for my major. I wanted to go to graduate school, but I didn't have the right stuff to do it in physics. I, I guess I was more inclined toward engineering. Work in R&D was still the hot spot in my imagination, but I was stumped as to what to do next. Here began my interim career sampler years. I spent the first five months after graduating as a volunteer at Ralph Nader's Center for Auto Safety in Washington, DC. My continuing education started in the architecture section of a Brentano's bookstore right around the corner from the National Press Building where I worked. There I discovered an inspiring book called Design with Nature by Ian McCarg. Next, following my interest in architecture, I worked for about a year as an office boy in an architecture firm back in Memphis. I got a fantastic introduction to design thinking through discussions with the young architects there. All right, planning on working my way through graduate school, I went to vocational school at night to learn a trade, ironwork. The welding teacher there was Eugene Schaefer, a New York City union iron worker. From his stories, I got the crazy but irresistible idea that it would be a great experience to work on a skyscraper construction project. <laughs> With that goal in mind, I followed Schaefer to New York. But job prospects were much dimmer than he had advertised. He and I had to settle for work in a Staten Island shipyard, repairing barges and tugs. I enjoyed that year, living in Manhattan, commuting to Staten Island, working in a shipyard full of Caribbean iron workers. <laughs> okay, when there were no boats in the shipyard, we workers were unemployed. One of those times, remembering that book from Washington, I went to a symposium where Ian McCarg spoke. How inspiring was he? I got myself into his regional planning program at the University of Pennsylvania the following fall. What a difference from physics. One time during the two semesters I was at the University of Pennsylvania, I went to another seminar, one by Dr. Howard Odom, a systems ecologist in the environmental engineering department at the University of Florida. He was running simulations of ecosystems on analog computers. I felt the call of science again and went for it. That was the beginning of my mini career at the University of Florida. I was able to get an assistantship at Dr. Odom's Center for Wetlands. I became a pay-as-you-go student. No iron work and no student loans required. My time in Florida was an absolute dream. Coursework I enjoyed but most of all, the challenging research projects. Generally, I was developing and testing a measurement method, adapting instrumentation, building apparatus, and writing computer programs to carry out the method. First, there were methods to measure water and radiation budgets of cypress swamps in a sewage recycling project. Two projects involved application of satellite data. One system was to make freeze forecasts for orange growers. The other was to estimate plant water consumption for Florida water management districts. Finally, I worked on a project to measure the effects of elevated CO2 environments on soybeans. Elevated CO2 was already a hot topic in the early 80s. Full disclosure, it would be totally misleading of me if I did not mention the fantastic social life canoeing and catamaran sailing that filled my free time. But what about my future? While at the University of Florida, I heard about the Gerard O'Neill, Gerard O'Neill's 
uh, space colonies and about the L5 society. The idea of space habitats grabbed my imagination and with hydrology, systems ecology, and measurement and control technology, I thought I had a way to make myself useful to the sure-to-be-continued space program. I was convinced that I finally had all my ducks in a row with space R&D career in my future. During this time, I went to an L5 Society conference here in Huntsville. Conrad Dannenberg, Klaus's father, was the featured speaker. And I'm sure we got that standard lecture that you were talking about. <laughs> As you know, large-scale space habitat projects have not yet materialized. So what became of my professional life? Pushed along by the projects I worked on, I became a software analyst designer. I would first do a deep dive into a problem I knew nothing about, and then design a software tool for its solution. My professional uh, life was shaped by three spending bubbles. First, the Reagan defense buildup. Second, the telecom boom. And third, the Homeland Security focus after 9-11. I started at a Navy contractor in Northern Virginia, developing a system to find and troubleshoot noise issues of Trident submarines. The challenge was to display a small subset of vibration data searched out of a three-month Trident patrol. At this point, I got married. My wife and I bought a townhouse in Reston, Virginia, me with an eye on job prospects at the NASA office there, still hoping that interest in space exploration would kick up again. We lived in that house 20 years, raising our two daughters there. My next project was design an installation of a 200 magnetometer system to measure magnetic fields below minesweeper equipment to ensure that it would not set off mines. To demonstrate the accuracy of the magnetometers to the Navy, we used a NASA facility in Greenbelt, Maryland, which allowed you to accurately simulate any magnetic field anywhere. That turned out to be my last brush with NASA. I had some serious hiccups in my working life, unemployed months and months at a time. With an environmental engineering degree, and a diverse string of non sequitur projects, I found it a challenge to sell my analyst skills. In an effort to be more readily employable, I made a strategic shift into the areas of finance and human resources. In my mind, what I was now doing was generic software design work, and I was ready to work on any problem, greatly enjoying new ones. Then came the telecom boom, and I fished up a job at Concert Communications, which became an AT&T British Telecom joint venture. My first projects there around 1995 were web applications which allowed um, for US and United Kingdom employees to choose their benefits online. Both British Telecom and AT&T own shares in hundreds of deep sea cable networks the backbone of international internet traffic. The most challenging project of my career was the development of Central Billing Party. Yes. Okay. That's the uh, reward for being last. The most challenging project of my career was the development of central billing party software for the consortiums that own those networks. Okay, a central billing party is a finance group that pays the invoices coming, from a consorti coming to a consortium and then bills each consortium member their share. It was a big analysis and design challenge, but the most character building part was to get all those finance groups to agree on the design of a single shared system. After the telecom work wound down, I found a CSC job with US Customs and Border Protection. I had a group responsible for hardware and software and an easy pass system for cross-border commuters on the Mexican and Canadian borders. The system read radio frequency IDs in the cars and then flashed photos of the car and all approved occupants to the agent controlling the lane. The challenge was to obtain lane performance metrics remotely from Washington, then to improve lane performance. One more minute. 
Following that, I found work doing computer support at General Dynamics plant in Woodbridge, Virginia. They were developing the experimental fighting vehicle for the Marine Corps, a tank that can go 30 miles an hour on top of water to ensure surprise in amphibious landings. Then came a slow convergence of boredom, unhappiness, and frustration. I was not getting any really challenging projects at General Dynamics. Our 22-year marriage ended in divorce. Hoping to transition to healthcare software to do something new, all I heard was, but you have no experience with healthcare software. By then, I had a long track record with ignorance and inexperience, and I knew they were my forte. <laughs> so, without a wife and grown kids, an old high school idea resurfaced. What about the Peace Corps? That idea gradually gained traction, and in 2012, I left for a couple of years of Peace Corps service in Ethiopia. There is no way I can tell you what a great experience that was, getting to know Ethiopians, all the while immersed and puzzled by Ethiopian street life, culture, customs, food, landscape, ethnic groups, etc. If any of you are interested in a talk about a really exotic, interesting place with lots of photos, just ask. All right, one more minute. <laughs> there was nothing casual about the death of my space station dream. It died hard. But looking back at the last 50 years, I'm amazed by the steady stream of space exploration accomplishments and fascinated by the great science and engineering that has come out of them. I'm thinking of the orbiting telescopes, the flyby planetary explorers, the planetary lander robots, um, the gravitational wave observatory even. Maybe those were wiser investments than spending the money on large space habitats. Okay, Heidi, I will stop here. Thank you for listening to this tour of my pinball career. I didn't get the career I prepared for, but I did manage to pay the bills, get my daughters through college, and stay reasonably well entertained. Thank you. Three, two, one, zero.